Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited about the show today. Guess what got me out of my little self-imposed hiatus to give you some really cool information. It's the coronavirus, COVID-19. I recorded this episode a couple of days ago, and as you know, the information changes rapidly. If there's any major mistakes, I will go back and correct the episode. So without further ado, and with a lot of really cool announcements, here is a very balanced approach to COVID-19. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Super excited to be back after a brief two and a half month hiatus. You know, we're back with another episode of the 3030 Health Podcast with me, my sidekick, the the, the Robin to my Batman or the uh, <laughs> the Batman to my Gordon, you know, because uh, I don't know if anyone knows, but I am uh, Commissioner Gordon. Adam Stowski. <laughs> that's a, that's a, such a long Hello. story. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Rubis. How are you? It's been a while. I don't think I've talked to you since, or not that I talked to you, but not that we haven't, you know, done any sort of podcasting since I think AANP. I know, man. You know, it's uh, it's crazy. You know, I I've been thinking about this. You know, it is such an important part of uh, educating our community, and it is, you know. Uh, I was talking to one of my patients, and she asked me, uh, hey, uh, you've been so busy. And she was like, when, uh, when is the podcast coming back? <laughs> and I was like, damn, uh, you know, people actually like this. And I think it's just so important, you know, because it's it's another avenue where we can educate our, our patients and another way of spreading some of this good information. Just a little uh, overview of the things that I've been doing while we've been gone is that I've been, I, I have continued to record podcasts. I think I'm going to change the format to where I do like 10 podcasts and I drop them as a season. And that way, you know, I can research my topics a little bit better. I can provide better information and I don't feel like I have a deadline because I want to get something out every week. And that way, you know, we can have a little bit more quality control, have some awesome guests like we've, we've been having in the past, and then also, you know, not bore you too much with uh, my ramblings. But uh, we have a pretty cool topic today. Yeah. And speaking about spreading information, it seems like there's a virus that has recently been spreading around. The virus that we're talking about has been gaining, you know, a lot of traction in the media and everyone's freaking out about it. You know, in our school, we kind of got, you know, the some nuts and bolts about us to possibly think about it. If, you know, someone's coming with these kind of symptoms, you know, have this uh, virus on your radar. And what we're talking about today is the coronavirus. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. Ruiz, you did some... Uh, virology while you were at SCNM and and you know you did some studies with with viruses so I feel like you're you're someone who who could speak about this a bit better so what is it? Let's start with this. There there is a lot of misinformation and there is a lot of misinformation that's fueled by fear and yeah we should be very cautious about any sort of mutated virus but. I, you know, I even read a couple of Facebook comments and social media comments saying that maybe uh, it was human made and, and uh, we're trying to disseminate it to, you know, for population control. And I'm, I want to explain with some history about this very particular virus. OK, so first, what's a virus? It's really hard to explain what a virus is because a virus is just a protein with some genetic information that needs a host to replicate. So it cannot replicate on its own. So it basically enters a vector and uses the machinery within that vector to replicate. So there's a lot of discussion about 
philosophical discussions trying to decide if viruses are even alive <laughs> because this is just this little thing that has genetic information that mechanically attaches to a cell, enters the cell, hijacks mitochondria, hijacks the nucleus, and then starts replicating and creates a, an, a copy of itself and a copy of itself, and then it invades that cell. The cell breaks and explodes, and then it delivers more viruses to other cells, and that continues to go on and go on and go on. The coronavirus and other viruses associated with this classification of viruses is a single-stranded RNA virus, and it's one of the biggest viruses uh, that we've ever discovered. It is close, genetically speaking, uh, associated with the flu virus, and uh, that's where I want to start the story because there is so much information that we know a lot about this type of viruses, and I want to talk about why this virus happened or this outbreak happened. So before we get in and start talking about this, any questions, uh, you know, about what, what I just said? For me? No. For, for me, I, I understand all this because we kind of come from the same background. But I guess if you want to try to make it more simplistic, you can go ahead and try to attempt that. Let's start about, you know, this single-stranded RNA thing and then, you know, uh, why it's important that it's so big. So because it is such a big virus and it's a single-stranded RNA virus, it can affect the cell and it has the ability to mutate really rapidly. Now, the flu virus uh, does, this, th does the same thing, and that's the reason why every year there's a new vaccine, and these vaccines have different versions of the virus trying to anticipate how the virus will mutate in the next flu season, and we're trying to figure out what is the best way of informing our body. Trying to predict it. Yeah, trying to pre predict and trying to train our body to have a fast reaction to this virus. So the coronavirus is interesting because it is not a human virus. You know, it, it is not naturally a virus that occurs in humans. So it has to mutate in order for the virus to be able to implant itself in a human. That is called a zoonotic infection. Okay, now... Let's go back in time. Yeah, there was an outbreak of a coronavirus that affected horses, and it was affecting race horses back in Australia. And these horses were frothing at the mouth, and they would die. Okay, and they didn't know where this infection occurred or how it occurred. And you know, a lot of horses, you know, uh, were in trouble. Some were euthanized, and by the time it was controlled, a human had. Uh, one of the vets died of this uh, from this virus. Through some investigation and some epidemiology, it was found that these horses had a type of coronavirus that they acquired from bats. So they were in Australia. There was this big field. Uh, in this big field, there was a single fig tree, and fruit bats were hanging out in this tree, and then they would eat the figs, and the figs would fall, and maybe the horse ate some of the figs, or maybe the horse got some saliva, or maybe even scratched from one of the viruses, and then that virus replicated inside the horse, the horse caught the infection, and then when humans came in to try to save the horses, they were in such close proximity that they themselves got the virus. How would the humans get it from the horses, though? Because typically... Uh, my understanding is with viruses, a lot of the times when they're being spread, it's usually through respiratory droplets. So if you sneeze on someone, you'll get it. How are they getting it from the horse? So the horse developed the symptoms of like they were having a little bit of hemophilia. So they would they were like bleeding internally and they were frothing at the mouth and choking on their own saliva and blood. So the veterinarians had to go in and stick their hands into the horse's mouth to try to save them. So talk about close <laughs> proximity and droplets. There you go. Yeah. So so that that's what happened. And in and, and this is interesting because the bat born coronavirus was not of, uh, able to jump to a human host. But by going through the horse, modifying itself, evolving, it gained the ability to infect the human host. And this is 
sort of like the thing that happened in Wuhan with this coronavirus. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember the SARS outbreak. Yep, I was going to bring that up. I was going to ask, how does this virus have any sort of relationship to the SARS outbreak that I think was happening in the Middle East? So same thing, you know, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, it happened in, in the Middle East, and, and it is believed that came from horses, from race horses too. And then it, there was another one um, more recently that, uh, that occurred in China. And again, another example of having a virus that replicated, mutated, and then there was a spillover infection. In the case of the coronavirus that produces severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, I think that was uh, believed to be, it, it came from uh, servals, and that was the, the reservoir host. So a concept that I want to introduce at this point, okay, is going to be the concept of a host, an end host, and a reservoir host. You know, a lot of these viruses, you know, uh, or the coronavirus family is able to live without killing its host in bats. So bats are a reservoir host for a lot of different viruses that can be very, very deadly to humans. Like the rabies virus, you know, uh, coronaviruses, you know, all of these families of viruses can live in bats without ending the lifespan of the bat. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an, another really cool story, you know, because bats downregulate their immune system because, they, you know, they eat like mosquitoes and they eat all of these things that can be vectors for other viruses. So they have evolved to have a very low responsive immune system. So they can, they can accept these viruses and really not do anything to them. So then those viruses can live in them and have like a mutual relationship where maybe they're replicating and, you know, they're spilling over in feces and they're spilling over in, in manure and uh, guano and the virus continues living. The bat doesn't get that affected and it's nice and happy. The problem is when you have a bat that is able to infect a different host, a replicating host that serves like an incubator and now this virus can replicate 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 and spread without any stop gaps or you know it can just spill over and start infecting other hosts and then you have the end host so in the case uh, of australia horses were an end host so the virus replicated in a way that was killing the horses at that point, you know, because this mutation, this this variety of coronavirus killed the horses, it didn't spread that much, which is not what's happening with the current coronavirus. So another example of, of this would be uh, H1N1, you know, the, the swine flu. So somehow a flu virus infected this pig, this pig created a mutation that was able to jump from pigs to humans, the pig served as a replicating uh, host, and then humans were the end host. And you, know, you remember the, you know, that global pandemic. So what happened in China? Well, you have this open markets where they have all of these different types of animals and what we would consider exotic animals that are being trapped, and then they're be, being used as food, okay? So there were bats in this, in this open market. And next to the bats, there were pigs and chickens and all these different live animals that you go to this market and you go, hey, I want to eat that bat. And they grab the bat, they skin it, and, you know, and then they give it to you and it's nice and fresh. But now you have this Petri dish with all of these different animals exchanging all this genetic information in the form of viruses and one mutation is bound to happen. So now imagine having all of this super concentrated ecosystem in a place that might not be uh, very sanitary and it is just a recipe for disaster. 
So to go back and comment on, you know, this um, this idea that maybe this was a uh, human made virus. Well, the the paper that I read was that, you know, this type of mutation uh, wouldn't happen in nature. Well, the chances of a mutation occurring are super exponential in a logarithmic scale that it is just so unbelievably impossible to imagine all of the different combinations that could happen with a virus. So uh, to me, having seen this in previous outbreaks, you know, talking about the SARS outbreak in the Middle East, the SARS outbreak in China, this coronavirus outbreak, and this horse uh, coronavirus in, in Australia, to me, it's not impossible that a new novel virus was created just because of the juxtaposition of all these different species and uh, the ability for, for viruses to mutate in order to survive. So what you're saying is I should probably get rid of my pet bat I have currently uh, saved in my apartment. Well, I think you should vaccinate the bat and don't eat it. Ah. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't eat bats. Uh, you know, but no, just, just think about it. You know, domesticated animals, pigs and cows and, you know, all of this stuff that are raised, you know, in a good way, you know, in a, hum in a humane way and that, that, that have a high level of, of cleanliness and, and you know, in, in a good facility should not expose us to this weird zoonotic uh, viruses. But when you have a place that concentrates all of this stuff and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's a cultural thing and something that, you know, maybe we are not uh, well equipped to discuss, but in a scientific way, I feel pretty confident that, you know, th markets like this should be heavily, heavily regulated. So now let's kind of, you know, leave the subject for a second and let's talk about the flu. Okay. So flu, same thing, you know, it can replicate and, and create mutations and, and a new novel flu happens. And when this, this new flu, you know, gets spread with the seasons, you know, with the uh, air currents throughout the world and, you know, all of these things, we are well aware that we have a flu season and we should take precautions. As a side note, the reason the H1N1 uh, virus was so bad or, or we were so scared is because back in the 1800s when the Spanish flu um, happened, the people that were more at risk for dying from, this, uh, from, from the Spanish flu were healthy people. Their immune system would overreact to this virus and they would create these cytokine storms that basically made people coagulate and die. And millions of people died all over the world. And that's what's scary, that we might think, oh, you know, I don't need to be careful or I don't need, a, you know, the flu vaccine or whatever because I'm a healthy person. I'm not an elderly person. I'm not a child. But if the right mutation occurs with one of these novel viruses, then we can be in that same predicament where people with low immune systems, just like bats, might be spared and the people that die from these infections are the healthy people. So without scaring anyone and uh, maybe trying to get, you know, immunocompromised by, you know, staying up late and messing with their circadian rhythms and eating crappy food, there are a lot of things that we can do in order to have a good immune system or to prevent the transfer of infections, you know, and we're going to discuss those things before we end the show. Back to the coronavirus, it is very important that we are aware that, you know, epidemiologists all over the world are tracing the, the movement of this virus. So with this coronavirus, I think the problem is going to be with immunocompromised people, people that are exposed to it a whole bunch, for example, healthcare workers. And, you know, I think we're going to be able to control it as long as the epidemiologists get full disclosure of statistics, 
they have access to um, all of the different uh, cases and they are able to trace back and contain, you know, and, we, and we've seen that China has tried to do some containment within Wuhan where they closed off the city. Imagine that, you know, imagine being in Portland and there's something going on in Portland and then the government says, we're closing down the city. No, no trains. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that is scary. Yeah, I've been actually really impressed with the heroic public health efforts that have been going on, from honestly, from like a, a global stance on this, especially with China. And, you know, I do feel bad for the people there who do have to kind of suffer for the greater good of the of the rest of the world so that we don't spread some sort of epidemic and, and, and whatnot. I do think that China is cooking the books. You know, just to save face in the in the global uh, uh, stage, I think they are not being very honest with how many infected people have there have been and how many deaths. And it's sad as a scientist because that's information that could help the rest of the world. And then reports about you know this hospital they built in like six days, you know, and all of this stuff. But you know, it's still, you know, it's still, I think uh, there they, there can be a little bit more freedom of speech in order for us to be able to have a better picture of what's going on in order to protect the rest of the world. But yeah, you know, uh, just you know, cording off a whole city—that's a massive effort. So then, you know, what can we do? to be prepared in case of a global pandemic. Well, wash your hands. That's that's so important. Uh, washing your hands, having good, you know, uh, overall health, you know, being able to have a good diet that is going to uh, keep your immune system active and vigilant and most importantly, well balanced where your body is not overreacting to an infection or underreacting, which both things are really, really bad. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we were we were at work and uh, one of my MAs uh, was like really, like, was just not feeling well, you know, and she was overwhelmed and, you know, she's such a hard worker and she was like struggling, you know, trying to keep up with her daily tasks and I was like, What's going on? You know, the next day she shows up and she is a wreck. And I'm like, okay, go into a room. I'm going to swab you. And uh, sure enough, she uh, she was positive for the flu A. And, uh, you know, she was sent home. We, you know, disinfected all of the computers around, you know, all of the stations around the office. We gave her an IV. We gave her, uh, I prescribed some Tamiflu, okay? And uh, it was caught right at that window where we need to catch flu A for Tamiflu for uh, being effective. And uh, we did some uh, anti-nausea medication because that's one of the biggest problems with the flu, that you can get dehydrated pretty fast. You know, you can have diarrhea, you can have nausea. Nausea is horrible with, uh, with the flu, but body aches. And, you know, just like you feel like you've been hit by a truck. I don't know if you've ever had the flu. No, thankfully, I, I get vaccinated every year. For oh, it, so. No, man, it's it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. But, uh, you know, so interestingly, you know, reading uh, some of the research, um, well, she had to, she had told me, you know, I just feel like crap. I just hope my husband doesn't get infected. You know, he has to work and it would suck if both of us, you know, have to miss time from work. You know, no one no one wants to do that. So I, I went on to PubMed and I started reading a couple of articles about using Tamiflu prophylactically. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. So you use 75 milligrams for 10 days, okay? And that kind of like stops the virus from even infecting you. And you might have a little bit, like a tiny little bit of this, the, the, the infection, but nothing to where you have to miss work or anything like that. Well, sure enough, man. He did not get sick, and he was living in close quarters with someone with a confirmed flu A infection, and that was pretty awesome. There's some rumblings as well on actually the treatment of coronavirus that they're trying out in Wuhan, and I think what they're doing is a combination of the Tamiflu and some HIV medications. Correct, yeah, and right now, you know, the WHO has been, you know, they're trying, I think that that was tried in France, if I'm, if, if I'm correct. I don't know exactly where it was occurring, but I just, it was kind of more of rumblings as something that passed my radar. 
Yeah, yeah. And right now, the WHO, you know, ha- hasn't stated, you know, they usually are pretty fast when, you know, when a global pandemic like this happens, and they'll say, we have a cure, this is what you do, these are the guidelines, you know. And so far, they, you know, they, it has been treated su- successfully, I'm pretty sure it's friends, uh, but not, you know, it hasn't been, you know, like globally approved, you know. Uh, and then this, you know, like things like Tamiflu and this, uh, this retroviral like drugs, Come with some problems, you know. They they intersect, you know, uh, the RNA and they prevent the replication. But some of it is going to intercept your own RNA, and that's why people experience, you know, nausea and hair loss and you know things like that. Especially with the uh, the old retroviral drugs that are used for um, HIV. You know, other um, HIV drugs like PrEP are not as nasty, but you know, even even Tamiflu can cause a lot of nausea. And if if a person is swabbed and they're past that 48-hour window where time of flu can be effective, I don't prescribe it because just the nausea is so terrible that that can, you know, exacerbate the problems that come with the flu. So in that case, you know, it's just everyone has to, you know, in the household has to wash their hands and that person has to rest and they have to be out of the office until that infection goes away. And what other preventative measures can we take against the flu? Well, like I said, you know, the most important thing is going to be, you know, not try to avoid exposure. You know, uh, planes have been uh, historically incubators for for transmission and it's just recycled there. You know, you have a person that ha- that that has the virus and is just, you know, going around the, the plane. So if you don't have to fly, if you don't have to travel, don't do it. Wash your hands. You know, there has been a shortage of uh, protective masks. And those masks are not very effective at protecting you from catching the virus. They're very effective at preventing the person that has a virus to um, transmit the virus. You know, they kind of trap all those air droplets. But they're not very effective at protecting you from the virus. In fact, you know, if you've ever worked at a hospital or or a clinical facility, there are special fittings for masks. They're called N95s, and they fit around your your mouth and nose, you know, with a tight seal. And uh, you know, you, sometimes you have to like even shave your beard if you have facial hair uh, in order for that mask to fit properly. And then you know, rest and take care of yourself. The last section, you know, I want to talk about what can we do in the functional, uh, you know, integrative and naturopathic world to help prevent disinfections. And, you know, there's so many cool things that we can do. You know, for example, we have IV therapies uh, where we can give you some uh, good amounts of vitamin C. We can give you some good amounts of glutathione. We can give you good amounts of zinc, lysine, all of these different things that have been proven to be antiviral or protective and immunobalancing, you know, uh, that can help before you go on a flight or if you have to do a flight or even if you are infected. And this is, you know, uh, there is no window for this type of treatment. There is no, you know, you don't have to be cautious about, you know, you just have to trust the person you're you're going to and having an immune boosting IV can be very, very helpful. When I was in, uh, in school, I, I wasn't fully convinced about IV therapies for infections up until I started using them myself in order to help me prevent infections. And I, I'm telling you, I've been exposed to so many different things uh, in clinic, and I am yet to be sick. And if I start feeling sick, I hook myself to an IV and and just, you know, uh, the symptoms go away and I feel great the next day. I don't know if it's placebo. I don't know, you know, but... It works. So uh, I'm a big I'm a big believer in IV therapy. And then, you know, we can look at the different herbs and different uh, types of uh, botanical treatments. And that's where I um, have spent a lot of time uh, researching and actually doing the actual experiments, you know, in a wet room to identify plants that are indeed effective for viruses okay and the biggest discovery that we've made is some education or some um, 
illustration on how Echinacea purpurea works against the viruses. So different parts of the Echinacea plant have different properties. And the paper is not published yet, okay? So I'm not completely at 100% freedom of uh, going really deep into detail on this stuff yet. Uh, but as soon as that paper is published, I, I'll make sure to uh, share it with everyone. But in essence, the echinacea plant and its parts have different mechanisms of action against the flu virus. Okay, One part of the plant helps the immune system. It upregulates the immune system. It upregulates IL-8 specifically, which is, you know, one of the cytokines that causes fevers and, and it gives you like those body aches. And, you know, so, it, you know, we had an experiment where we had some uh, some human white cells, basically, and we put some echinacea plant and let's say it increased the production of IL-8 tenfold. So that specific part of the plant helps you fight the infection faster, even though it might make you feel sicker in the short term. But that can help uh, shorten the amount of the cold. Another part of the plant actually destroys some of the RNA replication systems. So by doing a whole plant extract, you can have some antiviral activity and you can have some immunomodulating activity within the echinacea plant. Most importantly, preliminary research from the echinacea plant shows that water-based extractions from echinacea actually help the virus replicate faster. That's really interesting. Yeah, so in that, that's, that's very interesting because... You can see a lot of T formulations against viruses that might have a little bit of echinacea. And it's actually making it worse then. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> actually making it worse. Have you been able to, in your personal experience, combine some form of echinacea with the Tamiflu and find it to kind of make it a little bit more effective or have you kind of not explored that route yet? Well, we haven't explored, explored that, you know, it's, you know, this is in vitro uh, experiments that are, you know, they are like the first, the first line, you know, trying to explain mechanisms, Just you seeing know, if there's even a mechanism. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, you don't know how many classically or traditionally used plants that we've used and, and we don't see a clear mechanism and we just abandon them. Uh, not to say that the plant doesn't work. Maybe we don't have the right, experiment okay but it is it is very rewarding when we get you know uh, a plant and and we investigate its mechanism and we actually find it to be viable now what i can say is this you know we can use some of the research that we've done in the past with things like lemon balm that prevents viral attachment to um, to cells. And then we can use things like echinacea that we know that has a little bit of antiviral activity and immunomodulating activity. And then we can use things like mushrooms, which we know uh, help upregulate the immune system in the in, in the mucosal cells in the in the intestine. And we can, you know, we can make this combination therapies that in theory, you know, because they ha you know, there is no meta analysis and in analyzing this stuff, in theory, are going to help you fight infections or protect you from infections or help you recover from infections faster. And then as a side note, you know, getting the flu vaccine, uh, I know there's a lot of rumblings and, you know, and a lot of pushback about vaccines. In the end, it is your decision as an autonomous being, whether you want to take the vaccine or not. In the end, you know, uh, as, as a clinician, we are educated in teaching the science or the evidence behind them, and then you make the decision, okay, as, as with any vaccine. As a doctor, I find it that it is my responsibility to protect my community of patients 
for that reason, you know, uh, the vaccine is very important, you know, because I don't want to be the person that infects the patient. You know, if I have an immunocompromised patient because of cancer or whatever, I don't want to be the vector that infects this patient and puts my patient in risk. Okay. I've been vaccinated. <laughs> you know, I, I have more vaccines uh, than most people in the world because I work at a virology lab and I am required to have things like the smallpox vaccine, which is one of the nastiest vaccines ever. Um, I am required to have that in order to work at that lab. But that's my decision, you know, and if I could have said, I don't want that vaccine, I'm not going to work at this lab. But because of the profession that I chose, because of uh, the the things that I'm interested in, because of the things that I want to do and, and the people I want to help, I have decided that uh, the pros and cons of being vaccinated are well balanced. And, and in my case, I choose to vaccinate myself. Yeah, and I think like how you were saying before, uh, ultimately, if you don't want to choose to do that, if you are someone who then goes onto a plane uh, and you're traveling to another country, you're now kind of spreading that to other members. You know, you're in a very tight, confined space on an airplane, so you can now transmit that uh, potential infection to other people as well. So it's kind of, you know, it's also a global, not a global health, or technically, yes, it is a global health problem as well, but a, a public health service to kind of protect other people, not just yourself, because you end up putting people like the elderly and the immune who really don't have as much of a chance as someone who's at the prime of their health and, and can maintain that healthy condition. You know, the flu has already been estimated to have killed about 10,000 people. So it's not just, you know, uh, a terrible cold. It can it can kill you. Yeah, and it is, and it can hit, kill uh, healthy individuals, you know, uh, it can kill, you know, it, the elderly and the young are, you know, are the biggest risk, uh, and and yeah, it's sad that, you know, something that can be prevented, you know, and if you choose not to vaccinate, getting yourself some N95 masks, if you work at an office uh, or an indoors, you know, uh, make sure you uh, you try to isolate yourself a little bit more. If you work as a clinician, being respectful of immunocompromised people or people that are sick and, you know, wearing your personal protection, you know, universal personal pr uh, protection daily, washing your hands, coughing into your, into your elbow, you know, all of these things matter. And these are ways that you can prevent the spread of a virus. Look for the upcoming drop in the next couple of weeks. We're just finishing the editing. We're going to do a big drop and hopefully we can have way more fun with this, uh, with this chats. And I hope uh, you continue enjoying this podcast because I sure enjoy recording them. Do you have any sort of like um, flavors to each season? Like, is there going to be a specific topic for a season? So like, will season one, be on thyroid health season two will be on all the um, mechanistic properties of any sort of botanical medicine that you've been studying you know et cetera, et cetera. dude you sound like i have a plan <laughs> you sound like <laughs> you sound like i've thought about this <laughs> no you know i think i think my biggest my biggest goal okay you know recording something every week and having a deadline weekly makes it really hard to curate a good conversation. You know, like I've been thinking about, the, I, I've been thinking about this podcast, about today's podcast for about a week and a half, you know, and putting my thoughts uh, in order and trying to get everything straight to give the best information to, to the people listening. I think that respecting people's time is very important because there's so many podcasts and there's so many uh, so much information and at times i've felt that i am just recording something because it's the deadline and i have to drop something you know weekly and and uh the last thing i that i want is to just go on the mic and record as an obligation rather than as a service. So I think that if we do this seasons and just dropping 10 podcasts and, and then, you know, waiting like four or five months and then dropping 10 more, I think the quality of the content, it's just going to be so much better for everyone listening, you know, because things are going to be a little bit more thought out, a little bit better researched. And then, you know, 
continue having you know special episodes that I'll drop if I encounter someone that is like super interesting or if there's an, another global outbreak and we need to kind of talk about it as a special episode. Awesome. Awesome, dude. You know, I know you've been busy. Uh, thank you for taking an hour of your time to uh, help me record this. For an- anyone listening, you know, what are you doing right now? What's uh, professionally, where are you in your career? <laughs> professionally, where I'm at, I graduate in June. Uh, that's the plan. And, you know, currently working on residency applications and finishing up uh, research projects that I'm involved with. So it's tying a lot of the the loose ends up and really just kind of, you know, doing that last, very last push of, of medical school. So it's, it's a little stressful. It's, it's a little, rewar- it's not a little, it's very rewarding. And it's just a lot of excitement and, and, you know, unknown. So things are getting pretty excited right now. I know. And then, and then you start uh, studying for boards and then uh, you, and then you cross to the other side, man. <laughs> and then that's it. And then there's no more exams for the rest of my life. You would think, <laughs> you would think, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mickey and uh, Angie invited me to take part of their AIP certification. I am honored to be on that program right now. But guess what? There's exams, man. <laughs> I know. I saw that right at the end. There's a there's a there's an exam. So so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But, uh, you know, thanks for listening. And, and you know, I hope you guys st- stay out there healthy and, and you take some of this information and apply it to your lives. And I'll talk to you soon, Adam. Yeah, that was fun. Have a good one.